Hi everyone, welcome to the GDC Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am a contributing editor at GamaSutra.com and I am a, your community manager for the Game Developers Conference. Um, I am uh, sitting here today, unfortunately not playing a game like I usually do. We are unfortunately watching some pre-recorded footage, but the game we are checking out is a little game called uh, Knights and Bikes. Um, Knights and Bikes comes from Foam Sword Games. It had a successful Kickstarter a couple years ago. Um, uh, principally, uh, its designers include a one Rex, uh, I should have really figured this out beforehand. Is it Crowl or Crowley? Crowley's good. Yeah. Crowley's good. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, not having the Y there, um, made me hesitate. Um, Rex, how are you doing? You, you worked on this game, I'm, right? I did. Yes. Yeah. I'm very good. Thank you. Yeah. Good to be here. Cool. Uh, thank you. Hey, everyone in Twitch chat. We, uh, we're happy to have you here. Uh, feel free to... Um, drop your questions in Twitch chat for Rex. Uh, we are taking them. Um, Knights and Bikes came out a few weeks ago. It is a uh, two-player co-op adventure. Um, or you can play it single-player like I did here. Um, featuring a couple kids on a... Uh, I think it's a fictional British island, right? It's not a real one? That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's a fictional island uh, going out on an adventure. That's a li It's a little bit Goonies, a little bit... Um, if I say it's a little bit Stranger Things, it's only because Stranger Things is a million things that from the 80s already. Um, but thankfully, what's interesting is unlike a lot of other 80s themed games, some of which we've checked out here on this channel, it's it's not evident that it's like that. But it does have that like kind of kid-focused adventure vibe um, that kind of appeals to everyone, the kid that's inside everyone, I'd say. Is that fair, Rex? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, it was definitely a choice to... <clears throat> Like, um, try and get some of that, like, coming-of-age stuff that you mm -hmm. get in films like The Goonies. Um, and I think a lot of the, well, to me, a lot of the best coming-of-age stuff, maybe it's because I was a, you know, a similar age at the time, was um, films in the 80s, like The Goonies and Stand By Me and mm -hmm. things like that. So, um, yeah, that was a big influence, like, really early on in the project. Um, you know, and we <clears throat> we took a decision not to go, like, you know, over the top with the 80s references. Um, you know, I think Stranger Things is is cool, but it is quite a sort of cleverly put together package of like the greatest hits of the 80s. And I don't always think that it's necessary adding like a lot to that. Um, whereas we wanted to go a bit more kind of, I don't know, tell our own story whilst being influenced by those kind of films. Right on. Uh, I guess we haven't given Knights and Bikes a fair introduction yet. Uh, Rex, how would you mind um, explaining where Knights and Bikes came from and what kind of game you were setting out to make uh, besides just being like say, an 80s game, which really, yeah. it, it sort of isn't. <laughs> yeah, um, so it is a uh, action adventure um, about these two girls. Uh, one girl called Demelza, who is the one currently on her bike uh, with the red hair. And the other girl is called Nessa, and they are exploring this um, this island, um, trying to find a legendary lost treasure. Um, and you know, like with any of these things, you know, that's that's the big quest. But along the way, they're learning a lot about friendship and about sort of I don't know. They're like pushing slowly at the edges of like. Um, uh, well, of, of their, like, childhood experience, you know, they're starting to get independence, um, you know, and that's that's very much what bikes, you know, bikes of the title represent for us. You know, when you're a kid and you get your first bike, then you can actually go somewhere without your parents. So mm -hmm. it's just on that edge of, like, kids that are, are still young, their emotions on their sleeve and... and um, you know, just be very expressive and, and open, but at the same time, just trying to play it a little bit cooler and, and, and kind of, you know, gain some independence and, you know, just grow up a little bit. Right on. Um, uh, moving on, uh, Rex, uh, is it accurate to say that your title on this product is kind of art director and kind of co-creative director with along with Mew Yu? Yeah, I mean, like, like you say, I mean... Um, you know, it, it is a tiny team. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just two mm -hmm. of us at Foam Sword, um, which is a company the two of us set up. So it's me doing um, like art, animation, writing, um, yeah, all of that kind of stuff. And then Moo is doing um, 
like the tech side and, and, and like holding the company together and doing the business and all of that side. So, um, you know, it keeps us very busy. Um, but, um, you know, it's kind of fun as well to be able to make a, a game just sat at your kitchen table like I am now. Um, and even though there's just the two of us, um, we have a couple of great collaborators as well. So we have um, Kenny Young, who uh, was um, audio um, head of audio at Media Molecule for a long time. Uh, so that's where both myself and Moob met. Um, so, you know, we, we both know Kenny well, and he's a great friend and a, a incredibly um, great sound designer as well. So we have him on the project um, helping us out. And then also um, the music is composed by a friend called Daniel Pemberton, who's a, he's a big shot um, film composer these days. So, uh, you know, he doesn't work so much in games, but um, he's recently done Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And um, he's just done the new um, Dark Crystal series as well. So, you know, he's a... A very busy guy, uh, but we had a, got a little bit of his time as well. So, um, yeah, right on. Uh, Spider Verse and uh, the Dark New Dark Crystal series are both really good. Um, yeah, yeah uh, Rex. I guess I'd say like, here's a question: When you, you and uh, I guess talk about you and Moo real quick in your work. Um, mm. It's one thing to sort of talk about nights and bikes being an adventure, but there's also kind of a specific. There's a specific way this game plays. Um, uh, there is kind of a top down, you know. Uh, One's a brawler. One one is a brawler. One is melee. If I were describing it sort of ca sort of bra candidly, but there the way you interact with the world and the environment is not like you aren't on a dungeon crawling adventure. It does feel like you're in this lived place, and it's sort of how two kids sort of poke and prod at the world around them. Um, uh, what was your guiding principle for making gameplay and sort of they're like I sometimes I feel like games like this can sort of fall prey to. They have with between incredible animation, um, the game itself, the gameplay itself doesn't have its own identity. But thankfully, you all here have your own identity with this gameplay. Like, what was kind of your guiding principle for making this thing interactive? Uh, well, I think um, I mean initially, um, I think it can help to just pick um, like another game to be inspired by, so that you have some kind of basis. You know, like mm -hmm. when we worked on Little Big Planet back in the day, you know, we knew we wanted to make a, a sort of 2.5D platformer. And that was very useful because then you could be quite experimental within that framework. So um, for this game, um, I think the two of us, we had slightly different, um, slightly different obsessions. Um, uh, so for myself, it was Earthbound. Uh, it's one of my favorite games of all time. Um, and I just loved the, the combination of sort of the real world being given a video game twist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like the, the, the different like, abilities that you got always like made sense. And the, the fact that you were, you were fighting like bullies and people that had like listened to too much jazz music. And, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, they were just, it was really memorable. And obviously like the story and there's quite a sort of, bittersweet element to it um so that that was definitely an influence um and then moo he uh loved uh secret of mana um that was one of his favorite games um you know from a similar era as well so we knew we wanted to make this this kind of top down well semi top down perspective um to be able to like run around in the world quite easily um like early on, we actually tried um, turn-based battles, um, but those didn't really quite work so well. I mean, you know, they're, they're two energetic kids running around, like, you know, getting up to trouble. It felt a little bit strange to be just sort of like, you know, sort of sitting there and stroking your chin and pondering your next move. It didn't really feel like what, you know, the kids would, in the game would do. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, you know, a lot, a lot of the gameplay is just... Um, it's just thinking. Well, how, how would how would I react to that if I if I was just a, a a mischievous kid who just you know just wanted to look for treasure and dig up you know dig up the soil and check what's under each rock and uh, just you know be really curious about the world. 
Um, you know, they don't have any, um, they don't really have like so much of the, uh, the pressure of like slightly older kids would have. Mm-hmm. Um, no, at the moment we're in the video, we're actually, um, referencing the fact that, um, Demelza, she does have some quite, um, dark things in her, in her background in that, um, her mother's just fairly recently died and, uh, she's kind of processing that. Right on. Um, uh, I'm going to reach into my question pile for a minute. Uh, in the meantime, chat, we, I can see some fine folks out there. We'd love to hear your questions. If you want to hear more from Rex uh, about his art process, about Nights and Bikes design process, uh, or if you just want to know what, is, what album he's listening to right now, um, ask away. Um, uh, Rex, I know that uh, uh, there's something very particular going on with the audio in this game. Um, if you um, pay close attention, I left a little bit of audio up for folks to hear it um when the dialogue is happening there's like this kind of plink 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 like it almost sounds like rain it's either rain or or something falling on wood and it hits every kind of uh string by string it hits sort of every word that's generated um what's driving that that's a really cool yeah here it's a drum it's like a little drum for beardy man um and it's like yeah could you dig into that system yeah i mean well (laughs) I don't know if I can dig into it that much because, you know, I wasn't quite so involved in, in mm-hmm. that. That would be something to really discuss with, with Kenny. But um, I think we were sort of thinking that, um, you know, in a little bit like, um, uh, what's his name, Charlie Brown, you know, you, you'd have like the, sometimes when the adults are talking, they're mm-hmm. just making sort of like, wah, 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 wah. And you're kind of as a kid, you're just like, whatever, you know, I'm not really... I'm not really concentrating on what you're saying. Um, and I think it, it does create a nice sort of thing of feeling like, you know, our two girls, they've got their own way of communicating. They often talk with these subtitles that are just popping up very quickly at the bottom of the screen. Um, and they're quite in tune with each other. Uh, whereas, you know, when they, when they come and talk to an adult, you know, suddenly it's like the sound of, you know, pots and pans falling down the stairs. You know, it's a very alien... Um, a very alien tongue to them, really. Uh, because the adults, like, you know, they see the world completely differently. I mean, if the adults had come into this room that we're in now, I don't think they would be imagining a little puppet theatre with some with some shrimps talking to each other. Okay, you know? so that's what's happening here. I was so wilded out. I, w- I went into this room and I was like, what is happening? Like, is that the curse? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely, um, you know, I've had a lot of fun with just... Um, you know, with each pass of the game, you know, mm-hmm. like things are worked on in a very iterative way of just thinking, oh, I'm sure we could, we could ring a little bit more out here. Uh, you know, if I was, if I was a kid running into a, a warehouse that just had like lots of seafood on the ground, uh, could we maybe do something with that a little bit more, you know, rather than just, uh, well, just crunching around in some, in some shrimps, um, you know, actually Bring them, to, bring them to life. I mean, here, Demelza is having a conversation not with the fishmonger, but with the fish. Um, and, you know, the fish doesn't have a lot to say, but, uh, you know, it's just um, trying to um, trying to just create this, this quite different dialogue between the characters and the world than what the adults would have with, the, with that same location. I don't know if it's interesting, but um, weirdly... I've actually got, I didn't know you were going to play this bit, because this is like two hours, yeah. two hours of the game, something like that. Um, I've actually got, because I, I do all my like design work in sketchbooks. Yeah. Um, so I've got, I mean, you know, I've got stacks of them. Yeah. Uh, like this. And I just thought it might be interesting to just see a page. Yeah, let's see it. That space that you were looking at. I don't know how well you can see that, but, um, you know, I... You know what's, map and Rex, it hold on. So th- your image froze just before you held it up. Ah, so you got I'm, to see me rather than the sketchbook. That's your something. face is just kind of <laughs> hanging there, and this is quite awful. Um, hang on, everyone. I'm gonna pause our footage real quick. I'm gonna Rex. I'm gonna redial you for a minute. This okay. is all gonna happen live on stream. This is the art of live video, everyone. Rex, uh, one. I will call you right back. All right, everyone. Sorry about that. This is what happens. Uh, I'm in California. Rex is in the UK, getting some Skype. Um, 
Anyway, we got a few folks out there. Uh, how are you all doing today? Feel free to... Okay, Rex, we got you back? Movement. Movement. All right, yes. let's see the sketchbook. All right, I just had to, I had to rate how, uh, what the quality of the call was like. So I gave it one star. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, so this is, I don't know if you can see yeah. that, but uh, the map of the a, area. a page from uh, this area. Um, and, you know, I try and sort of map everything out in sketchbooks and like gradually, like, I, I guess my process is really to get everything like written down on paper so that you can really externalize it and, and sort of look at it and think about it. And I mm -hmm. think like tool tools aren't necessarily like the best tools for actually thinking. They're really good for doing and like mm -hmm. making results but um, not necessarily good for like planning stuff out and you know going off at strange tangents so um, you know I try and use my sketchbooks like a um, more like a visual journal really um, like sometimes it's it, it's more specific like this with like you know writing out a whole we've got the map and then maybe on the next the next page is like figuring out well what what abilities what are the things that the kids can do in at this stage of the game mm -hmm. like what could they what could they interact with um, and you know it just keep going yeah right on um, uh, Rex you did a GDC talk this year um, uh, the about the art of nights and, nights and bikes. Um, you talked about uh, to, to make the characters and to make a lot of art for this game, you would start by doing kind of a vector paint uh, or um, a, vector uh, a vector drawing, and then you would do um, a repaint with two specific brushes. Um, mm. And then that was kind of like, you would do that, and then there was like, then you showed off, there was that, and then there was the final pass. Um, would you mind talking about um, that specific process for making giving this game like a, a really specific look because it's got it's got a two-dimensional look that is papery but it's also a three-dimensional look in that you move around the space uh i really appreciated what you said in that talk at the time well um i mean the i think the you know, the, the the thinking behind the art style is really to try and give the sense that you are slightly seeing the world through the eyes of the kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes, a lot of that comes from the, the way that it's, it's, as you say, it's all painted with these two brushes and those brushes are kind of similar to like chalk and, uh, and pastels. So kind of like the, the, the materials that these kids would have to tell their own kind of tales, you know, if they needed to like, you know, at the end of the game, if they needed to like write it all down uh, to tell a friend, then they, you know, they might make something with similar materials. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't want it to look. I want it to look like one of those like stereotypical like grown up does kids artwork kind of you know uh, stick person with like a two D house and you know I don't know that sort of crayon style. So trying mm -hmm. to give like, an elegance to it as well. Yeah, it needs to be believable. You don't want to feel like you're just running around in like a crayon drawing. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a constant um, it's a constant balancing act of like trying to stylize things and make them look intriguing and, and different, uh, but also keeping it very believable as well, so that you really do feel that you are like you know you are in this this Cornish seaside town and you're exploring it and it's. You know, it's got a certain atmosphere to it. It's got a, a like a quite a rundown feel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the process um, is is basically taking a screenshot of the game uh, and then painting onto that screenshot with like a new item. Um, I find it quite useful to use the game as like the canvas, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So that you know, then you're like matching the style, and it you know it feels like it all ties together. Um, yeah, so that's that's you know the majority of the the, the kind of the painting side. Um, like you said, um, some of the things, particularly the characters, were designed in vectors first, just because it's very quick to like move things around and make different choices. Um, but then they'd be repainted in um, uh, with those brushes. 
Um, I think the brushes are really useful, just limiting to just two means that it ties everything together. You know, if you're going to make an entire universe, uh, of all kinds of different environments and, and, and different, um, yeah, well, just very different kind of regions and characters and what have you, it, 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 it's useful to have some kind of unifying thing that pulls it all together. And it's definitely been like that sort of painterly art style that's, that's really helped bring it together. Um, and then, like, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's not a static painting, you know, it, it, it animates. So mm -hmm. the animation was a really big um, thing to figure out um, with the game. Um, and trying to get a feeling of um, both like the energy that kids have, you know, that they're, you know, they've got endless energy. They're just, you know, just expending it the whole time, just running around, um, you know, they never sit still. You, you know, they're sitting on a chair. You turn around, you turn back. They're like sitting with their legs up the back of the chair. And next time you turn around, they're sitting completely differently again. You know, always moving. So it felt like the the art needed to be very, um, um, you know, have a have a sort of dynamic quality. So I mean, you can see at the moment there's lots of, you know, the little sort of flower beds all blowing around and flags blowing around and things. Um, and they're all pretty much all just hand animated, um, like by drawing multiple frames. Um, but um, some of the elements, like um, I mean, it, it, I tried to get a sort of stop motion feel, um, where it's you know it's drawing attention to the fact that it's being redrawn each frame. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of the, the animation term of like line boil where, you know, things are like wobbling and vibrating. Um, I think it's, it's, it's useful to convey that, that energy of the kids. Um, and, it's, and it's also useful because it has a sort of painterly look as well. So it kind of brings those, those concepts together. Um, uh, let's say something else about that. I go off on, you know, a big old spiel about uh, about art. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the characters are a, a mixture of um, like rigged animation, but then with um, with some like hand hand drawn elements. Like Demelza's hair, you can see there, uh, her little red bunches. Those are done in like a, a stop motion line boil style. Um, trying to convey both the fact she's always moving, she's got lots of energy, uh, the fact that it's a very stormy environment, so you know the wind is always blowing in her hair as well, but also it, um, I like to think that it's also representing um, the aspect of the game, which is that, that the kids are like adding to the world and um, with their imagination, so the kind of um, the movement of her hair almost represents like the ideas like fizz, you know like fizzing out of her head um, and throughout the game we use the hand drawn style to actually draw things onto the landscape as the kids are like imagining it so um, you know there's a bit later on where they see this um, this like car crusher in a um, in a scrapyard um, and you know, that's kind of a cool thing for kids to see anyway, but, you know, their imaginations get carried away and they, they see it as a dragon. So, um, you know, we, we use this style where I, like, draw, like, a, um, a white sort of ghostly um, stop-motion version of what the kids are imagining over the landscape. Um, we haven't seen, like, too many examples of that in this bit because it's quite relatively early on in the game. But, um, yeah, it, it's... I think the... The art gives us lots of ways to like play around and um, um, kind of be more creative um, with the with the way it looks. Right on. Um, uh, speaking, actually, I think those uh, those white speed boosts are a good example um, of that of those white lines coming in over mm. the over the sort of normal landscape. Um, Rex, this game goes. Uh, it does have that. It's a. It's a adventure with two kids on a small island um mild spoilers there is 
um, a, uh, a supernatural component to it that's pop that pops up really early within the first hour, and you're about to see more of it as we enter um, this next area. Um, how do you? Oh dear, this is when my controller just straight disconnected. Um, uh, okay, um, past me got it working again. Um, uh, what would you say is a defining when you have a game where you have you have a world, you have how the kids see the world. Um, and you have a supernatural component to it that follows. Um, how did you sep like like add in that third style? I guess like like this kind of when kids are already using their imagination and imagination lends itself towards the otherworldly. Um, how did you then define a style that and and implement a style that that could keep the the player knows that's real, that's ghosty, that's that's kids' imagination. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think um, I think audio helps massively there um, because you know if you see some of my kind of you know hand drawn sort of wobbly um, imagination type driven things, um, you know that if the if there's no sort of like audio cue, then you know everyone knows. Oh, that's 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 kind of it's kind of there, but it's not really there at the same time. Okay. Whereas if you see um, I don't know, if you suddenly see like a, a knight's gauntlet uh, which has come to life and starts charging at you uh, and with the, with the audio that's associated with it, you know that, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's going to hurt you. You know, that's a bigger deal. There's kind of an example that just popped up, those little pink sprites mm -hmm. that just popped up. There was a poof as they vanished, which, which kind of so, gave me a clue that something was up when I was playing this. Yeah, yeah, those are little like um, little court jesters. Um, yeah, because I mean, all, all through the game, obviously, like, you know, it's called Knights and Bikes. So, you know, bikes is a big element. And you're seeing lots of cycling around. Um, but also uh, the Knights of the title uh, refers to this ancient treasure that's hidden somewhere on the island that the kids are trying to find. Um, and that treasure is protected by a, a kind of evil curse, um, which will kind of reanimate uh, things that are not animating. Uh, and that's you know the main, the main kind of like video gamey uh, aspect of the game, which you know you have to deal with enemies and and, and you know that creates the drama. Um, on top of the you know the more kind of coming of age story and uh, you know all the themes about childhood and end of childhood and all of that stuff. Right on. Um... Uh, let's talk about level design. Um, I think this game is interesting in that um, it's pretty linear. Um, like you're going through area by area, and there's kind of a pace and flow to things. Um, but I noticed there's an exceptionally windy logic to all the spaces you go through. Um, some of it's natural. Some of it's natural, like the natural shape. Some of it's just houses or other objects getting in your way. What was kind of um, sometimes I, I feel like uh, games like this can fall into a space where um, they do have a great look, they do have a fun combat loop, but then um, sometimes the player can just sort of be walking from circle to circle where where combat is happening. Um, and I noticed that Knights and Bikes does a lot of work to make sure that the player is constantly using that joystick to like weave around the space. What was, did you, do you have any thoughts about making um, what the world felt like from a movement perspective, especially with the bikes, right? Like with the riding? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting that um, in the, in our first ever prototype, we actually had a completely 2D game, um, and uh, you know it, it looked cool. It looked like a painting, uh, and you were moving around in it. Um, but there was no sense of discovery um, because you know because the camera wasn't moving. You you never you never had things like being revealed as you move through the environment. And as soon as we switched to this. Uh, the view that you can see now where it's lots of 2D things but rode up in a 3D environment. It, it suddenly became much more interesting because as you moved through the, the world, you know, things would be revealed like, you know, either like being wiped off the screen like you just saw there or, you know, some, some lever that you didn't know was there, you know, slowly appears as you, as you move around. Um, so... The, the 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 visual style definitely helps um, uh, sort of spur that on. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of level design, um, I think each because 
I mean, up until this point, we haven't really on the stream seen like what I would call like a proper level. Uh, we're just going into one now, which is a bit more sort of, uh, like you say, it's more linear once you're, once you're inside it. Um, we've been looking up until this point at the more sort of like open world, um, you know, and that, that, that um, part of the game was there to try and give the feeling that the kids are, you know, pushing outside of their local, you know, their, their kind of sphere of, of, uh, of comfort almost. Uh, and they are like diving off into the bushes and they can cycle wherever they want and, and there's kind of a, like a carefreeness but also like a slight um, um, well, sense of um, a slightly ominous sense as well because you know they, they are going slightly into the unknown. Um, but when, when they get to a level like we're just about to get into now which is a theme, a, a theme park, uh, but a theme park like, out of season, um, then the, the game becomes more uh, focused in on on like puzzle puzzles and combat and 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 and, and you know more little I don't know little, little moments. Um, you'll see a little cutscene just coming up in a second that are all driving the story forward. This is funny. <laughs> I was very pleased with that visual gag. I don't know if you know if the rest of the world finds it as funny as I do, but I think it's. I was really amused by the idea of like just seeing someone with all the skin missing off their face and thinking that's horrific, and then realizing that it's just a biology book. And you know, I remember as a kid, I there was a there was a like a pop up book that we had in school, um, which like showed how the body worked. And when you open the pages, you know, it would it would show you like here's here's the human body, but with their skin removed, and it was just horrific. You know, I mean, there's. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything as uh, quite as disturbing as that book. So I guess that uh, I've sneaked into the game. Well, we've arrived at an interesting moment in uh, my playback because this is a point where uh, I got a little lost as a player. And this has happened uh, a couple times in, uh, in Nights and Bikes. And I sort of think this angle I navigated to is a little unfortunate. Um, uh, you, so what the what you viewer are seeing is me wandering back the way I came looking for some crisps. I'm checking mm. the buses and such because I was just told to find some crisps. Yeah. Instead of paying attention to the very obvious, when we get back up to the top of the map, you'll see there's a <laughs> white line that would have guided me right towards where I need to go. And there mm -hmm. I would have found said crisps. But instead I went back and kind of tried to follow park logic of like, okay, where can I get crisps at the edge of a park? Um, cool. So maybe I'm just dumb. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm a dummy. Maybe I'm a big old dummy of a game player. But... um. Uh, Rex, what are your thoughts about when when you're using these these familiar but art but but painterly components to making helping players understand what they're doing, what they're looking for, etc. in a game space? Well, I think um, yeah, I think it is all about little clues, like you say, with that white line, you know, that leads you through. It's it's very it is incredibly tricky, I find, to know how to balance those visual clues and. Um, you know, hit that sweet spot where it guides you, but without you really noticing that it's helping you. Um, I think if there's, you know, something we, we used to find on Little Big Planet was, you know, we would sometimes sort of stick in, like, because because of the way that in Little Big Planet you could just sort of like stick up, put actual like stickers on the environment, and sometimes we put like big arrow in to help you, but. Um, it, it, it really takes you out of the fantasy just having an enormous arrow just pointing uh, where to go. So then we replace that with just certain shapes that maybe like guide your eye in a certain way. Um, one of my favorite things to do on this game is to just put, um, put like birds or animals that will run away. Um, I think they're always like a good one because they move, you know, so they catch your eye. Um, and you know, most animals, uh, whether you Rex, think you'll go pet them or whether you just, you know, you just. Rex, we Hello? lost you, sadly. The, the We were try, trying to bridge this call between uh, uh, the UK and California. It was difficult. <laughs> could you repeat, uh, after the animals run away, could you repeat what you were saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, just that they, you know, an animal is, you know, that they're, they're moving, they, they, they're, they're, they're 
you know, they're, they're just something you want to interact with. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, whether you're like a mean kid and you just want to, you know, run up to it and cause it, you know, some kind of mischief or, uh, or whether you just want to go and pet it, you know, it's, it's something that, um, that I think players respond to. And then if that bird flies off in a certain direction, then you're, you know, you're, you're led that way. So I think, you know, there's lots of little, little tricks that you can, that you can put in, um, that just guide in a in a very subtle way. Right on. Um, are there any particular vis- uh, any other tricks you like? I I noticed in this level the orange and blue lines that we saw on the map back there show up on the ground. Um, are there any other particular visual tricks that you think your uh, developers should consider when trying to get players to go the right way? I think um, I mean it's interesting just thinking about what sort of space that you're designing. So I mean this is a theme park, and obviously if you're running a theme park, you want to make sure that you're people are able to move through the theme park. So uh, this was kind of an easier level because you could just use some of the um, the design um, tricks that an actual theme park designer would, you know, would employ. So we have these, you know, paths on the ground uh, that you know that if you're, if you'll just follow that orange line, well, you know, that will at least take you on a loop. And then there's also a, a blue line that's going off a different way. So, um, those are kind of useful. Um, I think sometimes things like if, if a level is, um, is more linear in terms of, you know, you need to move from say left to right, then just, just the way that like the wind is blowing through the level, you know, that can really help, you know, if the, if everything in the world is steering you in, in one direction, that can, I don't know, it's just, you don't feel that you're having the friction of, of, um, uh, you know, of the of the world pushing against you. Um, I remember a friend who um, uh, Peter who worked on um, Last of Us. He he was talking once about how uh, you know all the all the staircases. You always felt like you were going the right way because of which side your weapon was on. And if you're if you're kind of going the wrong way, then the staircase is obscured by the weapon. And if it's the right way, then it isn't. And you know cool stuff like that I, I really like obviously this isn't like a first person game so you know you can't use tricks quite like that but mm-hmm. um yeah i mean there's definitely a lot of sort of subtle signposting um and then you know like you know we 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 have to experiment and through play testing some of the some of the areas in this uh this particular level once you sorted them out their, their doors would open and you could, you know, continue a loop and like revisit earlier spaces. Um, and actually that didn't really work so well for players. Uh, I kind of liked having a little bit more, um, uh, you know, that it allowed you to explore more and, and, and walk back over scenery that you'd already seen. But um, the, the problem was that obviously like once you like, opened up one of those loops then a player can just start going around that loop forever without actually going off in the direction that they're supposed to be going. So, um, yeah, lots of um, playtesting and uh, responding to that. It's interesting how even after, after like, like everything you described was a very thorough, these are very thorough, it's a thorough process, these are thorough tools you use to get the player, like, figuring out that they're sort of, like, sort of just need to go forward. And it's interesting how players will still, uh, like, just reflecting on myself here in this level, um, you're going to see me backtrack of my own volition because I believe, like, I'm sort of stuck where I am, so I backtrack to see if I'm missing anything else. Yeah. But you're right, friction is sort of what tells play, or at least for me, friction tells me a lot. Mm. Instead of going the way, right way, it's that line about, I think, Halo. Um, you know you're going in the right direction if there are enemies showing up. Um, mm. uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure they also had complicated tricks related to like your your friend who worked on The Last of Us, but um, is I guess like I I I don't have much more to add besides it's interesting that players will still do dumb things I guess, <laughs> which as a designer like how do you and when you're trying to make something that's a little more there are games that like sort of like keep the space for dumb things open if you're talking about more open <laughs> systems driven games we had Astro Near on the Astro Near devs on here a while back. Um, mm-hmm. Games like that are very attuned for that. Like, if you do something dumb, it may be the the answer to move something um, 
to to be, do something right. Um, but if you're um, uh, in playing Knights and Bikes, if you do something like Backtrack, you're genuinely losing sort of... It's not that a game needs to be played efficiently, but you are in a state where the game is not being played the way you and Moo and everyone else wanted it to be played, right? Like you wanted the players to be constantly engaging, constantly finding the fun stuff you guys okay. made. How, what's sort of your thoughts about that and, and how to... Um, do, you have any, do you have any thoughts about, like, about that space for letting players... Uh, either letting players or accounting for when players do the dumb stuff that you're going to see me do. And you've already seen me done. I, I play games <laughs> dumbly. I think, I mean, it's it's definitely um, I, I would always like a game to allow players to play in it as well as play it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, there's, there's various interactions that the two characters and the goose and we haven't really talked that much about the goose. We've got a goose for <laughs> this entire game. And, you, you guys know. beat Untitled Goose Game to the Punch, and they unfortunately <laughs> ate your lunch on the goose run. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's um, particularly in a, in a game that can be played co-op, it is good to be able to, you know, play with each other, um, you know, so that you're not just constantly needing new content um and sometimes i get frustrated sometimes when i play like very you know beautiful um very dramatic games where you know you're running down a corridor and the the floor is falling away and you know it's it's very dramatic but as a as a craftsman i guess i'm i get very stressed playing that kind of stuff sometimes because I'm just like I want to I want to look at all the care that's gone into this corridor and it's all just you know disintegrating um, so uh, yeah that's just me as a player but um, I think uh, yeah I don't I, <laughs> I don't know yeah I don't hey, know hey, I I'll take it I, I to, rambled that. <laughs> you're allowed to ramble um, anyway we are coming up uh, only got 15 minutes about or so left in the hour we would love to um, we do genuinely like, like, like having user questions. I sound a little desperate, I'm gen but I genuinely want to hear. Um, we have some great folks who ask great questions to our guests, and I, I miss them. I want to hear their thoughts. Um, it's Twitch. Twitch is not just us. It's you. It's the viewer. Uh, that's what I'm told in the emails they send me daily. Um, uh, um... Rex, you have a really great part of your GDC talk, which is sitting there in Twitch, which I've linked earlier in Twitch chat. Um, you talk about uh, how you listen to audio to to help guide your your craft and the things you want to make. Um, people should go watch that talk. There's some really choice audio bits um, that both just sound like Knights and Bikes, even though they're not Knights and Bikes, and also they're just great. They're just great, um, weird British things. Um, uh, I'm really sorry. I've like. <laughs> <laughs> described your homeland as weird in so many different ways today. Um, it's pretty weird at the moment, I can tell you. <laughs> hey, politics. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, What? what's your... Um, this is a very abstract question, but what is your thought process for, for converting the things you're listening to into visual styles? Because you talk about both recordings and just general cafe noise as two things that mm. you like listening to. Well, I think um, I think often it's uh, I think people will often you know you can think of influences as being visual things often, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're you know from an art background like myself, and I always come at things visually first. Um, that will be the you know the focus for me, um, but. I find that it's actually quite useful to um, to use audio as your main influence uh, rather than other visuals while you're working, because like looking at other other visual styles and other visual work can be quite um, distracting uh, because you know you're 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 operating in the same space. Um, you know, if someone I don't know, you know, it just overlaps too much. Um, whereas audio is really is really interesting because it sort of augments what you're feeling and um, and like pushes you in strange new directions and 
you know, for me, a lot of like making games is is not just about the it's not about the not just about the look, but also about the feel and about the atmosphere and the tone and all of these kind of things. And and music will just transport you to a completely different world, like magically, you know, straight away. You know, to, if you just open up like you know your music library and just hit a track at random, it will just totally change the entire mood you're in and 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 the environment you're in. So I find, you know, obviously, you know, it's just great to put yourself in these different spaces while you're working um, and I think because I used to do a lot of trailer editing I used to like make all the trailers at Media Molecule back in the day along with other stuff so um, it's yeah you can just you can just really take players on a on a fun journey um, with audio um, as well as you know influence yourself um, and we don't have footage of it today, but um, the opening of the game uh, has quite a dramatic opening um, with this like wild punk track, um, which Daniel uh, wrote and recorded. Um, and it, it features a, one of our friend's kids who's eight years eight years old, uh, mm-hmm. just like absolutely, he's like screaming, screaming his lungs out, um, and. The idea of that track, you know, it's very punky. You can hear it on our launch trailer. Um, was to sort of set an intention of, you know, the, the, these are kids with like, you know, too much energy and 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 you know, anything's possible. And uh, you know, it, uh, we didn't want to have one of those like slow openings with just like lots of establishing shots, particularly as it's a two-player game. You know, you want to be just like right into it straight away. So having this like wild punk opening track. Like really, sort of set the tone for the for the rest of the game. Um, yeah, so yeah, I just audio audio is the best, um, you know. And I, I always really enjoy like, working with with audio people because you're you're trying to achieve the same goal, but there's and there's total overlap between what you're doing, but also there isn't any at all. You know, I don't feel there's I I would never like lean over and like. You know, start tweaking the tweaking the synthesizers. Um, whereas, you know, it's quite easy with uh, in in other areas to like act, you know sort of get a bit carried away yourself. Right on. Um, uh, we are coming. Uh, let's see here. Um, I keep I just keep talking. What time it is? I have more to talk about than that. Um, Rex, uh, Nights and Bikes has boss encounters, kind of. Um, what are your what are your uh, earlier I thought of bulldozer, um, it uh, it wasn't on camera unfortunately. Um, what do you think makes a good boss fight in a game like this? I think boss fights are interesting because they used to be you know the high water mark for the skill you taught the player, but mm-hmm. knights and bikes is only just loosely te- the the new tools are like you said it's more about poking and playing and prodding. Um, what do you think makes boss fights work in a game like knights and bikes? Uh. <laughs> That's, that's kind of an interesting question because um, uh, I actually hate boss fights. <laughs> no, no, that's that's okay. I'm uh, I'm pretty ambivalent about not, it myself. I I am not a big fan of them at all. Um, I find what really kills me is if, particularly these days when games have become more open and more experimental, and um, you're just able to play them in your own style. I hate it when I get a boss battle where I just have to do a very, very specific thing. It's like doing a it's like doing a puzzle where you are being shot with lasers and, you know, everything else is being chucked at you at the same time. And uh, I don't particularly enjoy uh, that. And I don't really enjoy the, the just constant failing over and over again. Particularly, you know, if you're really enjoying a game and then suddenly you hit this massive difficulty spike and you're like, well, I'm never going to get past that. Um, you know, and we've kind of got the only, uh, really the only um, medium where like, people don't get to the end of the experience that they've bought, mm-hmm. um, which I, you know, I always find frustrating if it happens to me. Um, so, 
I mean, our, our boss fights are, you know, they're there for some some drama. Uh, they're there to give you a good moment to like high five each other um, afterwards, and you know, sort of congratulate, you know, your your co-player if you're playing it two-player. Um, but you know, then they're, they're not there to um, just prevent you from progressing. Um, there's, you know, there, there's some extra drama, but um, they're, they're not too, um, not too taxing. Hopefully, um, you know, I think uh, it'll be a long time, but it, before, um, you know, I feel that I want to do a boss fight that sort of matches up to Res, which is my favourite game ever and has the only boss fights I really love. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I should follow up. What about Res? Uh, we there. Uh, I need to plug more GDC things, I guess. But we have a great Res post mortem sitting in the GDC vault, uh, which I guess I'll drop in the chat. But what what about Res makes it really resonate? Resonate for you. Hey. Whoa. Hey. <laughs> resonate with Rex. Um, so uh, I think it, you know it, it is that it's that perfect fusion of. Um, of all the things that make games great, it's uh, you know it's the audio visual uh, interactive experience. Um, everything you're doing just feels so good, um, but it's it's so surprising as well the way that um, I don't know it, it's just brought a lot of different influences in. It's not like you've gone into a computer and it's all like you know techy and that's it. You know there's the whole of like. The whole of history is in that computer, and um, yeah, just just seeing the, um, the 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 artistic vision of that 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 game like, um, is just incredible. Yeah, I love it. I play it just all the time. Right on. Uh, as we close out our stream today, I guess we have time uh, to talk about. Um uh, Nights and Bikes was launched on Kickstarter. I know Moo is kind of at the business end of things, but I'd love to share your thoughts about. Um, uh, connecting with a player community and um, uh, uh, what do you think has been important in getting this game out in the world and connecting with people individually like being able to sell being and being able to sell this game too I guess is the next part of the question what do you think has worked for you as a as a, as a team in that regard uh, well we like Kickstarter's worked really well for us I think um, the thing that we have really concentrated on is just making sure that we have really good and constant communication with our backers. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a huge amount of time each month to, to just put together an update. Uh, we always put an update out on the first of the month. Um, and, you know, that, that's good for the backers. They, you know, they can see that the project's moving forwards. Like our project has taken a fair bit longer than we initially thought it would. But just keeping them in the loop and making sure that they all feel like they're on the journey and they're getting to see progress. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of backers that are just like, no, you know, take as long as you want. You know, take longer. We're, we're enjoying seeing the, you know, the how it's all coming together. Um, and from our side, it's really useful because it gives a, a, a bit more structure, um, like doing a backer update on the first of the month always means that like in the last week of the of the month previously you're kind of thinking oh you know what can i what can i show it's it's almost like doing like a milestone for a publisher you know you're kind of like what you know we've 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 got this big giant system that's all very clever but it's not uh it's not an easy thing to show so you try and sort of get a nice mixture of like um you know here's some cool thing that moves done is like um, you know here's, here's something much more much smaller but kind of maybe more characterful is like a little gif or something that maybe I've been working on here's a here's a photo of like Kenny with like um, a bike up on a desk with a hundred microphones around it trying to record the sound of the, the the wheels turning you know all of those little details I think um, it's just really good to share them and it's it's kind of fun if you do you know I don't really understand why you wouldn't if you go to a Kickstarter and uh, take a lot of investment from people, like you know, it, you just it's it's just fun to share it with them. Um, yeah, so you know, we've we've always tried to make sure that um, even though we're a tiny team, that we are you know always always there and communicating. 
and um, yeah, keeping everyone in the loop. Right on. Well, as my characters venture into Scone Grotto, um, and I begin to learn the <laughs> art of making a proper scone, um, I'm going to start wrapping things up uh, for the stream today. Rex, thank you so much for joining us. If people have questions about Knights and Bikes, where can they ask them? Uh, so they can uh, ask on on um, Twitter uh, at Foam Sword Games um, or on our website uh, knightsandbikes.com. Uh, those are good spots. We've got a um, we've got a Discord as well. Uh, you know, all the we have lots of lots of places you can find out about it. Right on. Uh, and like now, just like a person who does not make a scone correctly, I shall venture into the sea. Uh, with that, everyone, thank you so much. We would appreciate it, uh, dear viewers. If you were to click the follow button on this here Twitch channel, if you like chatting with Rex. Um, uh, you would also like the fact that we interview uh, a lot of other game developers here on the Twitch channel. In fact, in just another hour, we are going to be talking to the fine folks from uh, Gunfire Games. I believe we're talking to John Pearl. Uh, I think that's who we're talking to. I hope I got his name right here on the air. I did. Cool. Okay, we're talking to John Pearl of Gunfire Games about Remnant from the Ashes. Uh, it's a really cool... Uh, it's, not, it's, it's a third-person combat game that's got... A lot to uh, pay tribute to for Dark Souls, but uh, um, it's got a lot going for it on its own, setting and combat-wise, that makes it different. So, um, come back in an hour, and we'll be talking to John. And um, if you are interested in joining us at GDC next year, if you have a talk to give, the GDC Summits are now taking submissions. So, go by our website, gdconf.com. And you can find out more information about that. Um, if you would like to join, if you're a VR developer working in AR, we have XRDC going on in October. You should also join us in San Francisco for that. And if you're just a person at home who just likes video games and likes learning about how they get made, we super appreciate having you here. And we hope to see you next time we go live, which it'll be in... Um, It'll be in the next hour, and then we're going to go live many more times this month with many more great game developers. Rex, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.